And I am live on a Saturday night. Okay, guys, I'm uh, in a different part of the house tonight. Uh, we got people home and we're watching the greatest unintentional comedy of all time, which is Urban Cowboy with John Travolta and Deborah Winger back in the day. That's a movie that when I was a little kid, about seven or eight, I thought it was one of the most serious dramas ever. And uh, I got it about a year or two ago and finally rewatched it after all these years. And it's just, it cracks me up. How I thought that was a serious drama blows my mind. But anyway, got up this morning. I drove about an hour away, hour and 10 minutes away, and went to New River Valley Comic, comic Book New River Valley Comic Con. It's a comic book convention held at the New River Valley Community College in Dublin, Virginia, which was pretty good and actually had a pretty good haul. Uh, they actually had some professional artists there uh, with comic book conventions. And I think this is like their sixth one. A couple of years ago, I did a, a panel or two for this convention. And it sounds like this may be the last year for it because Gary, uh, the person who runs the convention with the college and it's free to go to, uh, is retiring this year. And I actually ran into a really old friend of mine there named Jay Rimmer, who uh, it was a surprise, you know, to see him uh, working at this college and uh, he's going to apply for that job. There's that's all kinds of people ran into Scott Connor, who probably pop in here tonight. Uh, man, he was Mr. Uh, he could have ran for mayor today. Uh, so many people, when he popped in, he had a bunch of people he hadn't seen forever run into him and talk to him. Uh, so it was a really good haul. So I'm going to show some of the stuff I've got. I've also been on the road for work uh, this week, and I picked up a few things on the road. I'm just going to throw them in this haul and stuff, right? So it looks like we've got some people out here, which is awesome. Oh, yeah. And by the way, I went and watched Zombieland tonight after the convention, and uh, we loved it. It was a great movie. I laughed my butt off. So it was fantastic. So it was great. So uh, if you know anything about the Doom Patrol, even the Doom Patrol TV show, uh, when Grant Morrison took over and things, there was an artist that worked on it named Richard C uh, Case. And I've, I've met him before. I've had him sign a book here and there. Uh, but he was there today, and he had some new prints, and uh, he had his prints half off. So I ended up uh, getting this uh, print of the Doom Patrol based on the television show. He signed it down here. Uh, got to see some of his original art and got to uh, talk to him a little bit about how how does it feel to have some of the stuff you worked on and helped create uh, end up on a TV show. Um it was nice. He was, he's a real nice guy. I had a great conversation with him. It was fantastic. Also there, and we met this guy before down at Heroes Con, uh, Scott Connor and I actually hung out with him at the hotel uh, after Heroes Con about a year or two ago. He didn't really remember me when I mentioned it, which didn't surprise me. But when he saw Scott and I standing together, he went, oh, I do remember you guys and stuff. He even talked about how we were waiting on a buddy to get a ride and bring a car down and stuff. But I was able to get Spook House, the second volume, number one. Uh, he also signed it. His name was uh, Steve Marriott, I think is his name. Uh, I'll get up there, but uh, I hated not getting this one when it came out because it has a great uh, Swamp Thing parody in it, you know. It's a comedy, but... Uh, you know, it's got a little scary stuff in there, but it has a great uh, Swamp Thing tribute parody in it that's very reminiscent of Bernie Wrightston art and stuff. Also, I uh, started plugging in some holes here, and from the 80s there, I ended up getting Secret Origins number four that plugs in a, uh, it plugs into the series that I have, uh, which was fantastic. Uh, this is Tell the Origins, uh, just, you know, a fun little series, great reference material and stuff, right? Fun stuff. We'll set that to the side. Okay. Now, uh, some of the stuff I got on the road, we'll get that out of the way, and I'll get back to the convention. But uh, I think all of these, I got them for $4. All of these for $4, right? Um, the last issue of Valiant Shadow Man, number 43 by Bob Hall. Um, Charlton 66. and I, Hey, Mr. Gretzky is out there. How are you doing? Good to see you here. Um, but uh, I love Shadow Man. From I love that Valiant stuff that Jim Shooter started, the Jim Shooter years, right? And uh, Charleston 66 and I got some great stories out of Bob Hall. 
at uh, Baltimore Con, and he was brought on Shadow Man uh, later into the series. Um, I think around I don't know what it was, maybe issue eight, nine, something like that. And Shadow Man was actually he revealed that Shadow Man was actually Valiant's uh, comics um, failure of a book, you know, if you will, and he was able to turn it around. But this is the last issue of the original Valiant run of Shadow Man. Uh, I'm a big fan of this series. It was fun. It was great. It was jazz. It spawned Nightman. You know, uh, you know it's a lot of good stuff in here. You know, New Orleans, Creole, stuff like that. Uh, but usually, no matter what a series is, the last issue can be hard to find down the road because it has such a small print run. What do we got here? Friar Tuck. Are you subscribed to Cave Fave channel? No, I'm not subscribed to it, but um, I've checked them out before uh, by people in the comments. Uh, break up, you know, tell me about the channel. I'd already seen what they're doing. Um, I think it's cool. I think it's fun what they do. But uh, when I watch it, I see them doing nothing different than the original comic book community on here. You know, so it, it's just sort of, uh, I don't know, I'll pop in every now and then and check out their stuff. Um you know, I've seen one or two things that I thought I heard, I saw them talk about, but, um, you know, when they get into Dark Knight, you know, I think it was back when they did Dark Knight Returns and stuff. Um, it, it wasn't anything new to me, nor uh, anything that hadn't already be, been done on YouTube. Yeah, Friar Tuck, those later issues of Valiance are tough finds. Yeah, that's what I mean. So I picked it up for a buck. It was a real fun series. Um, I always kind of pick up number ones here. Uh, this is my second or third copy of... Uh, Invisibles number one, uh, Grant Morrison's Invisibles from 90s Vertigo, uh, a great series that uh, he took a lot. He claims to have taken a lot of drugs while he was writing to kind of get that effect. So I'm always grabbing the number one. It really surprises me when I find some number ones like this first appearances uh, with the way TV shows are and the spectators are and things. I'm really surprised. I always kind of pick this up if it's in good shape. It's a Batman annual number 11 from 1987, but it has a fantastic Clayface story in it by Alan Moore. Uh, there's two, three stories in here, maybe two of them. But uh, yeah, I always pick up some Alan Moore stuff when I see it. It's just, you know, good stuff. Good, nice, fun stuff. And I've had this over and over, and I went ahead and just got both copies of this because this was actually a hot book for a hot five minutes. But uh, I got two issues uh, for a buck a piece of X Factor number 17. Uh, first appearance of Richter. I need some of them early Batman annuals. Mr. Gretzky, we all need all some of them early Batman annuals. This we do. But I went ahead and pack, picked these up. X Factor was a book that it was one of this and uh, Silver Surfer were probably the only two books I subscribed through mail uh, through Marvel back in the day to get. And what was so funny is I wanted, I can't remember, there was a book that I wanted and I and I filled out the form correctly, but something happened to the book to where they gave me Silver Surfer and X Factor for some reason. So I was getting these books and it was the old schools that I'd always heard about. It was actually sent in a, uh, a sleeve that looked like it's made out of the same paper that you get a paper bag at the grocery store in. Both ends opened were the thing, I can't believe the thing didn't slide down. And it would be folded, uh, probably to fit in a mailbox and stuff, right? So I, this is one of the only books. This, like I said, this and the eighty Silver Surfer were the only ones that I had a, ever had a subscription to, and I didn't do it again because of how bad of shape the books would come in sometimes. So it was kind of fun to get these. This was an interesting era during X Factor. You have David Muzicelli came in, uh, probably an issue or two before this. Uh, he was hot off of uh, Batman Year One, then he's doing X Factor. I'm like, what? So that was just a fun time. What we got here? They piqued my interest on black and white comics, which I couldn't get in the 90s. K Fade, that is. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, like I said, you could probably play around with a lot of comic book channels and stuff that have been around for a while, and you'll find plenty of stuff to pique your interest and stuff. Um, I was able to, for work, I was able to go out for dinner. And when I went out for dinner, um, right around, not too far from the hotel I'm in, there's a Books a Million. And they have a sale on their books every now and then. Uh, and I got this for two bucks. This is uh, volume four of Crisis on Multiple Earths. This is where they are collecting the Justice League, Justice Society team-ups that used to happen about every year in the Justice League title. Uh, this was really fun. 
Um, and what's I have most of these. That's what this this particular volume. I have most of these. These are you know these were the ones some crossovers from the seventies, which were fun. Had Justice League in them and stuff. Um, had a little legion of superheroes in there. But uh, it's from yeah nineteen seventy five, seventy six, seventy seven. Uh, Justice League 123 up to one yeah, Justice League 148 back in the day. And these are just fun to have and you get a fun little Alex Ross cover, but two bucks, no problem. No problem. And this was really cool to see. This was during the same sale and this is an oversized DC archive edition that uh, what, I think this thing sold originally I think for 50 bucks or something. Uh, but I got it for $10 and uh, and it's already, you know, it's wrapped in plastic. It's sealed, but it's already kind of ripping. But uh, I'm, I'm one of the fans of the Silver Age Superman. But my favorite stuff is are the Krypton stories. When the stories have to do with Krypton, I love that stuff. The uh, Crystal Force and just everything that they had. But uh, this is uh, Superman in the man. See, Superman, the man of tomorrow. And it looks like it's a mixture of Superman action comics and it looks like it's like he meets Hercules and, you know, it would be interesting to see what they've put in here. But it's Action Comics uh, 255 to 268 and Superman 132 to 139. I've never seen one this big, so that was a really good deal. Oh, okay. Dre Boogie is here. What's up? Uh, Mr. Gretzky, nearest books a million to me is in Goldsboro, North Carolina. Uh, what do you think of uh, Poison Ale? Worth, worth checking out. Poison Elves was a book, uh, was a guy's name Drew, and I think he passed away. But that, that that was a guy who you could tell loved his heavy metal, uh, and he loved his D&D and fantasy, and he kind of mixed the two, and uh, I, I had a few issues of it. it it's hit or miss. Uh, some of those books were interesting with what he came up with, and some of them were really hard to read. But I, I was always fascinated how he gave him, uh, you know, he gave this elf a magic revolver that never ran out of bullets. So there was some good stuff in there. Um, I think it's worth checking out, but I would not pay a lot for any of it, you know. Uh, Mike Gretzky, I'm a big Kurt Swan, Silver Age, and Bronze Age. Uh, Kurt, yeah, Kurt Swan, Silver Age, and Bronze Age stuff of Action Comics. Yeah, that stuff was just fun. I mean, some of the... You know, that there's just an air of Superman when they get into the sci-fi stuff that I just, I just like. I know it's corny. Uh, now, back to the comic book convention. Just about everything except for one book, um, I paid about 50 cents or a dollar for. Most of this stuff was 50 cents. Where New River Valley Comic Con is, you know, kind of a small deal, you know, a small comic book convention. It's also one of the more fun ones that I've been to. And uh, had some great deals since I walked through the door. I got these for 50 cents a piece. I've got to, I have to rebag them and stuff, but uh, I'm about to, you know, the Baxter series of eighties books that DC put out. Uh, I'm getting real close to completing the ones that I want. Uh, we're getting real close to after today of uh, having a complete set of infinity incorporated um, real close to having the new Teen Titans. I ended up with about half the Omega men without even trying Legion of superheroes, all that stuff. But with this one here, these were 50 cents a piece, and there's some early McFarlane art in here, Todd McFarlane. But, uh, you know, Roy Thomas is somebody I'm a, I'm a fan of, but he is very wordy, you know. Like, you, you're going to get a read. He pulled in Johnny Thunder here from Earth 2, playing with the Thunderbolt. I've always kind of been curious about that. Let's get that glare off of there. Yeah, I got the Shade. I'm a big fan of his. The Wizard, the Gambler, Solomon Grundy. I'm a huge Solomon Grundy fan. Got some hardcore McFarlane art here for the origin of Northwind. And then, uh, you know, you can kind of tell McFarlane had taken off and they bounced around with some artists back and forth. Um, what's real interesting with this is that the Fury and uh, Hector Hammond, the Silver Scarab in this, whatever he became, he also became a Sandman in this and had tied in. No game was able to pull this stuff and kind of continue lead a story in Sandman. Neil Gaiman, Sandman, and Lita played a big part in the Connolly ones. So uh, that's another reason I was already, I, I, when it comes to DC, I was a, I, I loved Earth 2, where they continued the characters from World War II, and these were the originals. There was just an atmosphere with them when I was a kid. What do we got here? 
I'm a, I, did, did a, I used to have a few Infinity Incorporated books, and they were good. Love Grundy as a character. The first 11 to 13 issues are solid. Jerry Ordway was on there. They bounced out of All-Star Squadron number 26, which was their first appearance. They were on fire there. And, of course, like all the Roy Thomas Earth 2 stuff, um, Crisis on Infinite Earths really threw a wrench in what Alan, what Roy Thomas was doing. So really the first uh, two years of Infinity Incorporated um, are solid, just like the first, you know, 50 years, uh, 50 years, 50 issues up to about 56 or 57 issues of All-Star Squadron were solid. But uh, they were still good reads. And uh, like I said, I just enjoy Earth 2 stuff, the legacy. Jaden, the original Harley Quinn. Uh-oh, look out. Origin of Nuclon. Uh, now, I mentioned JSA in my last live show about recommended books and reading. And uh, the, the JSA book that came out in 1999, I thought did a very good job of pulling a bunch of these characters from Infinity Incorporated and getting to the legacy of these heroes. And I thought they did a great job. So it's kind of fun to have these. And I love Mike Bear. Uh, Mike Bear, his art, I really wished he had done more. Uh, he's one of those guys that when I saw his art, I just really dug it. You know, heavy on the blacks. And this is the way he drew. It was kind of vertigo-ish before we knew what vertigo was. Okay. And now some of this stuff, um, usually you'll, you'll get the big book and wait to the end. But uh, I got a few keys. Get this camera set there. Yeah, J JSA Classified was a great series, too. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, I think I... I did it by story. Um, I think I had the Power Girl story that Jeff Johns did where they teased us with all the theories of what her origin was after Infinity Corp or after Crisis on Infinite Earth and stuff. It's good stuff. Um, what we got here? Tokyo Death Hammer. I have two young sons. They love Grundy. He's a good guy in my house. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was a great guy in uh, James Robinson's Starman. You know, we got to see a side of him where uh, he came real close with a few members of the cast all right not her first appearance but her first appearance as wonder girl i guess i laughed when i found this for 50 cents uh wonder woman 113 by john byrne not a bad copy considering it's a white cover and it hasn't been bagged i think this is my second or third one of this um i don't know if it's this g5 coming up or that dc is doing where they're replacing all the heroes or the Teen Titans show that's on the DC Universe app or whatever. But uh, this character has really uh, had a little bit of a bump in value. And uh, it's gone back to not her first appearance as Wonder Girl, but her first appearance was a few issues before this. Uh, I, I have that. I have that run. And this is the one where I actually spent a little bit of money. Uh, I spent a little bit of money because I've run across this comic I've walked away from this comic and it just increases in value, even if it's just a little at a time over the years. And uh, I'm really a fan of two of the characters, two of the series, if you will, that was in this. It's their first appearance. Uh, I walked away from this at Heroes Con. I've lost it once or twice on eBay. So when I saw this, I was able to get it reduced. Uh, you know, I got a pretty good deal on it. But this is the Dark Horse fifth anniversary special. From 1991, I believe. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic copy, except for the very top ridge of this book's got a little bit of, uh, I don't know, rolling or something. But uh, this is the first appearance of Frank Miller's Sin City. And I believe it may be the first appearance of Frank Miller and Dave Gibbons' Martha Washington. Uh, I love uh, both those series, and I have almost everything that's been printed of them. So, yeah, I was able to get this. I finally got a key book that I wanted. Now, the story with this is while I was looking at this, I wasn't through scanning this one dealer's wall of comics. And by a nanosecond, a nanosecond, something had caught my eye. I looked up, but right when I saw it, somebody else walked up behind me, saw it also, and said, is that 15 bucks? And what it was was a Donatello uh, one-shot. I think they called it a micro-comic or something can't think what they called it, but it was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Donatello one shot, which was a tribute to Jack Kirby. I have a VHS tape of the uh, early 2000s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle 
cartoon where they adapted that into an episode, which was fantastic. It was real touching, a great, great uh, little tribute to Jack the King Kirby. So I didn't get that for 15 bucks, and that might have been another thing that pushed me to go ahead and get this. You know, uh, Like I said, I've had this in my hands two or three times and just didn't pull the trigger. Now, I got this one just for the shits and giggles, no doubt about it, just because I laughed when I ran across it. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and I had seen another dealer there at the comic book convention have this number one issue and had two, three copies of it, and they were from 20 to 40 bucks because of online drama that he knew about right it just cracked me up right but here we have the harris editions of cyber frog by ethan van skyber one through four that i got for four bucks all back together i haven't even opened them to check them and stuff but i saw this and i laughed and i'm not gonna lie um i have another issue of cyber frog from another company that he did in the 90s and i'm totally going to flip them on ebay eventually just totally going to flip them after i look at it myself. Now, when Cyber Frog came out, no idea who Ethan Van Skyver was. I've got, he's done some great books, you know, and um, I watched his art get better and better and better. But when this came out, I ran across this, you know, on the stands and uh, I looked at it and I thought Battletoads. I mean, I, it's not a slam, but that's, you know, I just looked at it. And I saw, okay, that's Battletoads. I think I saw an article in Wizard or Comic Scene. I don't know. Somebody did an article on it, or maybe it was a preview. And I just kind of moved on to other things. You know, this was the era of Hellboy and Bone and looking for the cream of the crop in the 90s and 800 books a month on the stands. So, you know, it was just sort of like first impression Battletoads moving on. So that was hilarious. Okay, what do we got here? Uh, Photoshop opportunities there. <laughs> I had all the John Burns run of Wonder Woman, but sad to uh, say that I sold it. Mr. Gretzky, it, it happens. It happens. Uh, amazingly enough, there was a ton of John Burns run on Superman there and Adventure in Comics, uh, Adventures of Superman and stuff. There was a ton of that there. Uh, I saw it everywhere. It was, it was amazing. All right. Uh, something I got for a dollar was Rima, the Jungle Girl. What I find interesting about Bronze Age uh, DC Comics, in my opinion, is that even though Marvel nailed the superhero stuff, it's like anything that DC did that didn't have anything to do with superheroes was fantastic. You know, the Jack Kirby Fourth World, which is technically Space Gods, uh, Commandy, Reem of the Jungle Girl, Kong. The you know, they just had a lot of cool stuff going on, and this was a short-lived, underrated series. Now, Reem you know, they kind of kept uh, kept it alive. She popped up on the Super Friends cartoon and a couple other places. But, uh, yeah, just some great Joe Kubrick covers, some great stuff inside. You know, very cool stuff. Let's see, Cyber Frog, well, I showed up just at the right time. Kid Ragnarok, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're moving on. Now, this is something I bought, uh, stopped at an Ollie's and got. Um I got this simply because I enjoy the straight to DVD cartoon that they did of the Justice League Gods and Monsters. Uh, it was by Bruce Tim. Uh, you know, it was really spearheaded this, but this is a collection collected edition of some comics they did to tie into that. And they were not they were not good, but I got such a great deal on this. I think I want to say I got this for four bucks. Uh, a hard brand new hardback for four bucks. So I'll be able to kind of look at it again. But this is this is where um, we still have Superman, One Roman, and Man Bat, but they're different people. Uh, Superman is actually the son of Zorel. Wonder Woman is Orion's uh, wife, which is why I got this because she just showed up in the Hunger Dogs graphic novel. I, I don't know of her popping up anywhere else. And Man Bat is actually uh, Man Bat. Batman is actually Kurt, who was Man in a. Yeah, some great takes, more vampire, if you will, than bat. <laughs> yeah, Bruce Tim is fantastic and awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, just about anything the guy touches, I think, is just the least fun. Okay. And then I got some fill in issues here. Um, this is really odd with this issue. It keeps disappearing on me. I, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know if somebody's taking it or I don't, I don't misplace it. I don't know. But just this league year up number nine, this is where Superman pops up and. As you can see, Supergirl's been messed up in a fight. I think it changed her powers that she was so messed up. And Superman had to come in with some uh, scientific gear and operate on her. A lot of drama going on. They also, around this time, had uh, Metamorpho and 
Sapphire have a baby and the baby could, when you held the baby, it couldn't control its powers and it would, could turn people into elements and stuff. I mean, there was some dark stuff, heavy stuff going on with that book. Um, Toki Death Hammer, my Ollie's has comics collapse, has comics collapsing shelves. Mark Wade Daredevil stacked on the floor. It's a sad thing to see. Yeah, it, it really shows you what really is selling uh, with people who read the comics and what's going on out there with what they have stacked. I've talked about it before with what I've seen. And I'm telling you what, the, the Marvel stuff, um, I mean, I'm not going to really get into it, but what you pointed out here with Mark Wade and stuff, this their, their stuff's not moving. It, it really blows my mind to see this DC stuff really moving when it comes to the trades and stuff at these Ollies. Was Bart Stewart Sears still on the series by that point on Justice League Europe? He took a break. He did some inks in that one, but um, you know he stayed. He stayed on the series at least through the first twenty issues. I'm pretty sure because when they brought in the, were they called the Exterminators or the Eliminators? They came over from another dimension and they were all takes on on Marvel villains. You had Doctor Diehard who was Magneto and so on and so forth, things like that. Lord Havoc was like Dr. Doom. Um, and I know he did those issues, so I'm pretty sure he stayed on at least the first two or three years. I have the first issue signed by him where I met him at Baltimore Con. Let's see, Dennis Hayes. Hey, man, just got on. How was the event? I had to go to Martinsville today. Is it, a, is it on tomorrow? I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it's – I think it was just a one-day event, but you might want to check on Facebook, uh, the New River Valley Comic Con. Uh, also saw Ben there. Um, he has a, ch a channel. Saw him for a few minutes too. Now that it's popped in my head, We're, it's late. Justice League Europe was one of my favorite books. I had the whole run. I love the Red, Red Winter storyline. Um, yeah, I was on board from Legends, the miniseries, to uh, you know all the way up to issue sixty of Justice League, uh, and Justice League Europe, and uh, Justice League Quarterly, and. I even popped on the uh, Mr. Miracle series they had on. I was there from beginning to end for that era of the Giffen Demantes League and stuff. It was a great time. Now, some of these are upgrades and some of these are books that I love reading since I was a kid. And I just had to see them have a home and I couldn't believe I saw some of this stuff. But uh, I, I need to check. I may. I don't know. I'm, I think I need maybe a, a detective comic or a Batman comic here and there. But I think I finally have the complete, uh, except for those few books, uh, almost a complete set of Crisis on Infinite Earth crossovers. And this is definitely an upgrade, even though it's a direct market version. But Superman and the Creeper, which I really don't recommend people tracking this down unless you're a completist. I don't know what the deal with this was, but it really is some of Giffen's worst art uh, with what he was doing. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. I don't know why this was just kind of thrown together. Yeah, I don't know. So that was just to be a completist. I have a decent copy. But this is one of my favorite comics from when I was a kid. Um, a year before the Terminator movie came out, you had this story of Superman and OMAC where it's Lynn Wine, Lynn Wein and George Perez coming in. And OMAC has come back in time to stop somebody i think it was an android from killing one of his descendants uh so that he wouldn't be there this is just a fantastic one shot little book uh the dc comics percent 61 and this thing is in pristine like brand new condition like it just came out yesterday oh man this is so good stay puffed 83 is very cool man but this is just fantastic. And this is when Kirby drew panels and people smaller to where you got more story and more art and more detail. I mean, this guy delivered. So I highly, highly recommend finding this one book. It's good and cheap. It's fantastic. Um, what we got here? I got some people popping in. Kid Ragnarok. Okay, cool. Sears on JLE kind of got me buying DC more as a Marvel zombie when I was a kid. Uh, Bart Sears should have taken over Captain Adam. Uh, he drew Captain Adam so well in that series. I kind of wanted him to jump over to the regular Captain Adam series and give it like a, you know, a big shot to the arm there. Uh, Stay Puff 1983. What's up, man? All right, cool. All right. Now, this is a book that I just had to get because it's in fantastic shape. I mean, it's got a little rubbing on it and stuff here, but the colors are bright and in it. 
But uh, getting towards the end of Jack Kirby's active career here, uh, the second volume of Superpowers number one. I love these toys. I love the commercials. Uh, Galactic, what was it? Wasn't Galactic right before they did Super Friends Galactic Guardians? They started really pumping hard with having Dark Side be their villain. Um, and you know, you had to kind of bring him back a little bit after being seen on Saturday morning cartoons. But uh, I had to get this one because just the co the colors and the creamy pages inside just pop out with uh, the hunger dogs there and everything like that. Now, I'm telling you, the first two volumes of these superpowers, yes, they were toys and tied into it and stuff, man, but um, they're just fun. They're fun, and they have an atmosphere, and, you know, Kirby's got a unique style of drawing in this one because, like I said, he was at the end of his career. I think his eyesight was starting to fail, but uh, just fun stuff, finding that stuff. It's, a, it's an upgrade, by the way. Kid Ragnarok, 100 I agree 100% about Bart Sears on Captain Adam. That would have been great. And what was what was wild is I met him at Baltimore Comic Con. The dude was huge. The dude was tall. Um, I could tell that in his younger days, probably when he was in better shape, uh, uh, man, the guy could have been Captain Adam, you know. So, okay. Uh, this one always, always blows me away. This might be the second or third time I've run across this. 50 cents. These are all 50 cent books. But I got the Secret Origin special on the Batman villains with a Brian Bolin cover. And every time I run across this, it's in better shape than the first one. Um, and I've actually seen Hobby Lobby have this thing up as a kind of a cloth poster with the wood frame built into it um, that you can hang on the wall. Just a classic cover by Bolin. You know, just fantastic if you're a fan. And then I went ahead and pulled the trigger on this. I ran across others in better shape. This was 50 cents. So how could I like pass it up? But I got the variant cover of uh, John Byrne coming on the Man of Steel, uh, retelling Superman's origin after crossing the infinite earth where he kind of took over. We were, I was mentioning that a minute ago. I ran across this more and more over the years and stuff. But when I ran across one for 50 cents, I'm like, let's do it. And again, on the inside, the pages are like, look like they came out yesterday. They're just creamy new, and you can still and that you can still smell the uh, inks and the colors like it was yesterday. I don't know how these stayed so preserved, but that's the smell of comics that you love right there. Um, I got these for fifty cents a piece. Now this was a hot book before the movie came out, and it's calmed way down to where I'm going to say this is probably about a five to seven dollar book, maybe. And now that I'm looking at it, one's in rougher shape than the other, but this makes my third or fourth copy of these. But uh, Wonder Woman number six, the modern age, if you will, uh, appearance of Ares, who popped up in the Wonder Woman movie. And this book got hot a little bit. Now, the hot book to get now is issue number, after this, number seven, because of the cheetah popping up in the next movie. You know, so yeah. But I, when I saw these for 50 cents, I was like, I can't pass those up. I cannot pass those up. Now, sometimes we need to watch what we talk about on these live streams and what pops up over here because uh, it, it's because I, it seems like we conjure things up, which cracks me up. But uh, I got two issues of Warlord, but one is specifically the issue, and this is an upgrade now of the Warlord book I told that more or less retold and reframed the pages from Travis Morgan, the Warlord's first appearance in the DC Comics special number one or whatever it was i showed um yeah that's what got me out of all of these because it went from number 11 for 50 cents and then it jumped up to number 48 and then they went up from 48 to 60 into the 70s all the way up to like 131 so it was really funny for me just to find this number 11 hanging out there you know blew my mind but uh issue 48 uh this is when mike grail were doing some fantastic covers I found another one or two in the old, what's going to be the comic book room there. Uh, and this is what I was talking about, the backup. It's got uh, the claw, the backup of the claw in here. And you get an extra um, first look at A-Rack right here that was coming. So Warlord's been picking up steam along with Team America. I mean, this, some of the oddest books are really taken off. Um, I think these were dollar books. But, uh, you know, I pick up an issue of Preacher anytime I find it in there. Uh, and it looks like we get a giving away with murder, a sneak preview of 100 bullets. 
So I'm going to look this up and see if this is the first appearance of 100 bullets. Um, a couple of months ago, I went to a yard sale. I ended up finding, I don't know, the first six volumes of the trade paperback of 100 bullets. I was not impressed. That book was just not for me. But Preacher, uh, yeah, you know, to get an issue of Preacher number 51 for a buck nowadays, that's that's actually a good find. You know, that's not the first time I found some of those. And now I think I have a complete set of this series I'm about to show. Um, this is the book that caused John Byrne to leave Marvel with the way they canceled it. And it's kind of, it was the last straw, whatever. And I thought I had a full set. I think this only ran for 22 issues or something. I'll have to look it up. But it's the original Uncanny X-Men book that started in the Silver Age back in the 60s. Only ran for so long. And then it was nothing but reprints all the way up to issue number 93. And John Byrne is back, has backed up with this title to fill in the gap for when that reprint series was happening, what was going on with the X-Men. And I thought I had a complete set until I really got in there. And I'm like, I know I had that issue. I know I had it. But I was able to find number two. And I was really getting a little bit tired and probably needed to stop and eat lunch or something by the time I got to the boxes finding this one because I kept finding like issue 15, 14, 13 as I'm digging through the boxes, 10, 9, 8, I'm digging through the boxes and stuff. And then finally it's got to number three and I ran across a number one and I'm like, great. I, 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 I grumped or mumbled, I need a number two. And apparently some little girl that was cosplaying there just kind of jumped and got spooked by me saying that or something. I must have got loud and mean. But I flipped through a little bit more and found the number two where they're in the Savage Land. I love this X-Men series. Uh, John Byrne is being inked by Tom Palmer. Tom Palmer is my favorite inker of all time. Um, and of course, you know, we're, we're having some retro X-Men stuff here, you know, where it's just a simpler time. Uh, really good stuff. Um, Angel is in his, my favorite costume of his. Um, I can go with that costume or the red one back and forth, but that's that's the angel that I consider the angel. You know, Archangel's cool, but that's my angel. And then I'm just filling in gaps with this stuff right here. But two more issues uh, down of Jack Kirby's Fourth World by John Byrne. Um, number eight ties in with that Genesis mini whatever. I never read that, nor did I want to back in the 90s. And another one, um, issue number five, Walt Simonson covers. But uh, the first year of this, off and on, they had some great backup features. They had R. Adams, Howard Chaykin, Frank Miller. Um, I'm forgetting some other people. Jim Lee uh, had some really cool, back, you know, little backup stories in these fourth world uh, titles. That was just really fun. So, yeah, I think this only ran for maybe two years. So I'm finishing that up. And... Uh, I know we went pretty quick there and I could talk and on and on and on and stuff, but that was the haul for today and this week. Um, pretty tired. <laughs> so just want to hurry get that out of the way because we're going to have a busy day tomorrow. So I'm going to look at the, see if there's any questions or anything in here. Oh, okay. Love that issue. Great Brian Bolin cover. Yeah, it was good stuff, man. All right, guys. Well, that's what I wanted to show. Uh, I think my favorite thing that I actually picked up, amazingly enough, besides that first appearance of Sin City, is the print uh, by Richard Case of the Doom Patrol, you know, and, you know, the television version, TV show version. Uh, this is really cool. This is when we get him framed. It was really cool to meet him. An actual guy who wrote, who drew uh, Doom Patrol during the great Grant Morrison era. And that's about it, man. Hey, thanks, Gretzky. Saw some of those fourth world books at the comic book shop earlier. I like them. I'm a fourth world nut uh, anyway. Uh, I'm very forgiving with some of that stuff, uh, even when it's bad. But sometimes you'll get a, something very cool to happen in there. Okay, guys, I think that's it. Thanks for everybody that's popped in here, man. Y'all have a good weekend. And uh, later, be excellent to each other.